Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah Espinoza, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists who practice out of Chicago. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. Please remember that even though we are all licensed therapists, we aren't your therapist. If you are struggling with mental health symptoms, please find a local mental health provider. Da 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 da! So today we're talking about Bond, James Bond, specifically Casino Royale, which is the Daniel Craig version of Bond, um, where he gets pretty much introduced, not just as Bond himself, but it's like the closest we get, well, correct me, Ben, the closest we get sort of like to the origins of Bond, right, in Casino Royale, because the movie opens with him becoming a 007 by killing two dudes, right? Correct. Casino Royale is the first story in the James Mm -hmm. Bond novel series so this, oh. this is this is the start of bond and yeah. it's also a, the reboot that started the entire uh daniel craig franchise of bond after the um disaster that was most of the pierce brosson era <laughs> outside of golden eye those movies were bad and that video game people can't stop talking about that do not talk bad about that video game you are a child of the 90s you are not allowed to speak ill of golden i just said i've heard about if i've heard about it it must be pretty popular because I don't play. I don't play no games, mm-hmm. video games. We will play it today. I will hook it up, and you will play Goldeneye. <sighs> Anywho, <laughs> so what is this movie about? Casino Royale is basically like we see. We see him become 007, and we see he has this mission where this guy, played by Mads Mikkelsen, Le Chiffre, who cries blood, is basically a like kind of like dark web esque banker who is moving money around for like terrorists and things like that. And then in order to make money back, he ho- he hosts a poker tournament that Bond engages with. And then he meets a girl who is an accountant, I think, for the treasury of the British, whatever. And he know, falls in love with her. We'll talk about that later. And then she dies. So spoiler alert, <laughs> reverse spoiler alert. But anyway, so that's kind of the bulk of this movie. It just introduces us to Bond and kind of his swagger, Daniel Craig as James Bond. With all these like complicated... Well, maybe not to everyone else, but to me, factors happening. So what are we going to talk about with this? We're going to talk about the reality, sort of like fact versus fiction of like military. Uh, They reference like SAS and like he's an MI6, like the spy life. Then we're going to talk about antisocial personality disorder. So the criteria, how we see it presenting itself just on the paper, symptom wise in this movie. Then we're going to talk about everybody get ready for your bingo card trauma. That's the middle square of our bingo card. And then we're going to talk about relationships, the relationships we see Bond have with both Vesper and M played by Judy Dench. So let's get into it. So to start out with this movie, before we get into diagnoses, wanted to make sure we take a second to acknowledge that when we talk about James Bond, we're talking about an elite military and espionage operative. The life that he has to live and who he has to have been in order to pass selection to become what he is and in order to survive doing what he has to do requires him to and anyone like him to take on actions that are not socially acceptable, mm-hmm. that require people to have traits and abilities trained into them and innately in them that enable them to seek out positions where they are going to kill people. Mm -hmm. It is not like joining the regular military where you might see combat, you might not. Joining SAS is like the British version of the Navy SEALs. Mm -hmm. Getting into MI6 is like joining the CIA. And Mm -hmm. And reaching the 00 status, Bond is an assassin. Like his job is not just to be a spy, but it is also to disrupt, to take on terrorists, to take on bad actors. And in order to do that, people that re- have to do these types of jobs in reality have to forego a lot of their morals and adopt an entirely different mentality about human life than most of us generally keep. And before we talk about diagnoses, you always have to factor in the culture of the person and what their reality is before you slap a diagnosis on somebody and making sure that we address that at the start of this episode is important because we're going to talk a lot about antisocial personality disorder and what the presenting symptoms we see in Bond are as he's depicted here. But 
remembering that not everybody who is military, is special forces, is a government operative, has antisocial personality disorder just because they have to do these types of things for their job. Mm -hmm. But remembering that there is a human being inside of her that has to get put away and trained out of them in order to become that. And we see a lot of that in Bond. We see a lot of the gallows humor that is typical. We see a lot of the cynicism that -hmm. is typical of people that become advanced military operatives, SWAT officers, special agents, all those kinds of things. Like these, They have to adopt a different mentality because the people they're dealing with are bad people who will kill you and your entire family brutally. To adapt to that reality, you must become the monster to hunt the monster. And people have to understand that that doesn't necessarily make you a person who's been hurting animals and setting fires and having all sorts of deviant behavior throughout your life. When we talk about antisocial personality disorder, that's a lot of the criteria. There has to have been a lot of very dangerous behavior because antisocial doesn't mean they don't like to talk to people or they don't like to be around people. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean like I'm anti space social. <laughs> right. I'm no, it, it doesn't mean social. I'm antisocial. I don't like talking to people how it's used colloquially. No, antisocial means they do things against society. And you can be you can be somewhat socially charming like and that kind of thing too. Sure you can. You can they t- typically are. Look at Ted Bundy. Mm-hmm. And so I think you're making a great point, which we try to touch upon in a lot of episodes, which is how much is nature versus nurture kind of, or how much is, is the environment normalizing the quote unquote symptoms we're seeing as as we watch these movies as therapists. I'm trying to think of the word for it, but your the set of norms are just skewed. It's like how in the work we've done, we've all done crisis work in some in some part, and yeah. so like we all have had like the gallows humor. Not to the level they exhibit in this movie, but like something we, I'm sure that we have made jokes that would make other people listening to us like gasp. That's insensitive because of just the work we've done as well, because it's how you deal with it. And also because like your perspective just is skewed from being in the middle of it mm-hmm. so much. And yeah. And so I think we really see here, like what you're saying with James Bond in particular, just that it's that mix of he probably needed a lot of these traits to get picked for this work. And mm-hmm. then this work really just validates and normalizes and encourages a lot of the behavior that if he were doing any other kind of work would be really maladapted. Well, correct. And like anybody who does this kind of work, remembering that the difference between this and a personality disorder is that people are choosing to do this Mm -hmm. and are entering this and activating a part of themselves that is capable of performing this way and are then able to turn it off when they are outside of that environment. And people with personality disorders do not have that. They are not really able to turn on and off outside of the confines of a particular situation. So they're not rising to meet the needs of a situation that develops. They're having a reaction that's part of the way their brain development is different. And recognizing Mm -hmm. that people who are military, police, or special forces, anything that have had to go out and to take a human life doesn't make them a person with living with an illness Mm -hmm. it can cause a i'm gonna say it right now so get your bingo sheet out ready but it can cause trauma and (laughs) usually does because a a healthy human is impacted by having to take a life whereas a person who is living with antisocial personality disorder or or any other sort of thing that i'm going to use the word psychopath here because people use it but i'm going to also put the caveat on that that is not a clinical term there is not a definition to it in the dsm so it is not a diagnosable term there's tests for it that people use in the forensic world but it is not a clinically accepted term so that will be the last time we hear that word but or what people would call a psychopath, someone who has no emotion, no empathy, no ability to connect to the consequences of their actions, that person, like we see if you listen to the John Gacy tapes, that he didn't give a shit that he killed those people. He Mm -hmm. he flat said, like, what, do you think because somebody said I'm guilty that I should feel bad or feel guilty for what I did? I don't. Mm -hmm. Whereas when Bond gets out of those situations, you can see that it cl- what he has had to do to survive, what parts of him he had to activate, when those turn off, it, it, he dissociates and he goes into a trauma response. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so 
Well, the reason we wanted to bring up like antisocial though is because part of us doing this podcast in general is we watch these movies and we try to say like, what a diagnosis fit into what we're seeing on screen in front of us. And also, I guess what we should clarify too is that if we're going to look at this movie in a vacuum, just Casino Royale, we don't know anything really that much about his background. We don't know what he was like as a kid. I know in the in the later movies, which I can't remember very Skyfall. well. Don't Skyfall. Really, you don't really find out till Skyfall. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. He, we don't really know anything about his background. But from what I under, remember from that, he grew up an orphan, correct, Ben? Eventually, yeah. Yeah. It, and so also we can you can make an argument with the, like you were saying, Ben, you have to have some criteria for conduct disorder, which is like under 18 antisocial personality disorder to be diagnosed with it. And we don't really know that in watching this movie either. And we also don't know what he was like before, really before he did this work, which would tell us a lot about diagnostically. What is the symptoms of antisocial? You di- your disregard for right or wrong. So it's so like social norms, social mores, like a lot of risk taking, which we do see him do. Persistent lying or deceit to exploit others. We see him do this a lot in this movie. He's constantly lying, manipulating, being callous, cynical, disrespectful of others. We do see that. Using charm or wit to manipulate others. We see that. Arrogance, a sense of superiority, being extremely opinionated. We see Check. that recurring problems with the law, including criminal behavior, engaging in behaviors that would warrant criminal arrest if you got caught. Yes. Um, repeatedly violating the rights of others through intimidation, dishonesty, impulsive, hostility, irritability, agitation, aggression or violence, which we do see. All of the um, above. <clears throat> lack of empathy for others or lack of remorse about harming others. We see a bit of that. Unnecessary risk taking. We see a lot of that, which I think is what actually was I know was noticing a lot watching this movie is he's doing a lot of stuff that he does. He's being flashier than he needs to be, which I think is the movie part of it. And then poor abusive relationships, fail to, failure to consider the negative consequences of behavior, being consistently irresponsible, repeatedly failing to fulfill work or financial obligations. So where that gets tricky is I think what you're referencing, Ben, is that someone if we were like working with someone with like I'm going to shorten into AP, APD, they would have trouble possibly like keeping a job like their functioning would be poor like relationships job and so i think that's what makes talking about bond diagnostically trickier is that he does he is flourishing in his job because he's exhibiting these criteria so would he do well at a different job would be interesting i mean is he flourishing is not the right word that's also true he does also does i didn't think i realized to watch this movie again how much he flouts his actual job responsibilities is kind of doing whatever he wants yeah, which no, is he, right not he, good right he's m hates him <laughs> initially like <laughs> it takes them a while to develop a relationship mm-hmm. where she understands him but m is about duty responsibility mm-hmm. doing the right thing but doing it within the confines of what's allowed and bond is very much about doing it in whatever way he determines is necessary and Mm -hmm. showing complete and utter disregard like right off the bat when we see him at the end of that epic chase scene where he's Mm -hmm. going through the whole parkour thing and which is one of the best openings of an action movie ever fight me um but (laughs) him just executing the bomb maker in the embassy and then blowing up and Taking, showing absolutely no concern for whether he just burned alive an entire group of soldiers who are doing their job. Yes. And causing an international incident. All in of the, the above. <laughs> and yeah. And, and showing no remorse for it, going like, but one last bomb maker. Yes. He really takes advantage of or tries to manipulate the role he's in of like, well, this is what you wanted, right? A killer. You this is what you wanted, like a blunt instrument. So you don't. So now you're gonna get mad because I'm making my own calls based on. That's really where his arrogance really shines in this movie. Is like yeah. he makes a lot of calls. For instance, even like this in the small ways, like when he first gets to the resort in the beginning, he steals a car to and is really flashy with. I can't remember exactly how he does it, but he the valet someone confuses him for a valet. And he takes the car and he like makes this whole demonstrative show of it. And I'm like, he's being so flashy for someone who's supposed to be quote unquote undercover. <laughs> like he makes a big show all the time. Oh, yeah. Himself. yeah, no, for sure. In a way that goes well, against way that, his job. Well, and the way that like his name is 
Mr. Beach, but everybody already knows who he is because he's it's like acted Archer. Up. <laughs> yeah, it's like how Archer tells everybody that he's the greatest spy. <laughs> as soon as he touches base on a mission, he's like, "I'm Archer. I'm one of the best spies out there." <laughs> well, I mean, telling think, everybody. <laughs> who do you think Archer is parodying? Yeah, Bond. He's a parody of Bond. Yeah. But yeah, so you could ache, so diagnostically, this is the kind of what we call case conceptualization we'd be doing about Bon if we had to work with him of like, well, is he doing well at his job? Because he's getting in trouble. He's the only thing that's really saving him from being arrested is like the protection of the work he does and that in order to <laughs> prevent international incidents, they have to sort of sweep his behavior under the rug. Yeah, I mean, and M. Flat tells him that like really the the only reason you're not being killed or agents that do those kinds of things have the kind of decency to defect and just like <laughs> disappear and leave. Yeah. Like, like Judy, not make it our problem always, all the time. Right. Mm-hmm. Judy Dench was such a amazing choice for M, but to have her have to express to him that like, basically the only reason you're not getting in trouble for all these things is because we need exactly you to deal with Lashifra mm-hmm. because we need exactly like an antagonistic, narcissistic <laughs> flashy personality type to shake mm-hmm. him off his game because Lashif is smarter than everyone also shows all of the antisocial personality <laughs> traits mm-hmm. that Bond has like he the whole like plot of the movie is what sets it in motion is that as Lashif our lovely investment banker for the terrorists which already shows he has no regard for human life just uh-huh. making money yep. is that he shorts a hundred million dollars of terrorist money to try to short sell on a stock because he's going to blow up a company's prototype plane and sink the company stock so then he can short sell the stock. That's how he's getting himself in trouble. So he's gambling on top of already working with the most dangerous people who show up and threaten to cut off his head. <laughs> and among his, other things. And among other things. And his girlfriend's arm. And he just goes hmm. <laughs> I think I can just sort of get together a poker tournament, guys, and get this money back. <laughs> Which, just to think about the arrogance of that, of I can beat the best poker players in the world who are willing to risk mm-hmm. ten million each, and I'm going to beat them all. Like the level of arrogance of that. So, looking at is Bond thriving in his job, or is he, you know, within the course of the writing of this story, just exactly what's needed to be the antagonist? And had it not been exactly this situation, he would have been in the brig. Yeah. And also, I guess I want to highlight the cinema part of this. Like, we like to make sure we mention that this is a movie with, like, a movie character. And so if he wasn't this flashy, he just wouldn't be as interesting to watch. So it's also, like, a big part of this, like, bravado and arrogance is, like, a staple of this character. Mm -hmm. And so... That I just want to acknowledge that we're trying to fit, as we always try to bring up, we're trying to fit tried and true psychology on a character who is made up. Yeah. And therefore is not a real person in the real world. But yeah, like he just, yeah, breaking into M's apartment, like breaking into your boss's apartment, like even though he seems to have regard for M, he has no problem pushing her boundaries and like getting under private information and like lording that over her and like teasing her when she's not in the mood to tease like he even in people that he seems like he has affection for he really struggles to respect them to respect them or their boundaries or he flagrantly flaunts in front of her that he's breaking into her apartment he knows her secret identity he knows her password he leaves her computer activated he uses her sign in when he's in the Bahamas supposed to be laying low after causing an international incident. He doesn't log in with his credentials, uses hers. And that part of it too, that's also, he's not doing his job. Like he is doing whatever he wants because he has his arrogance. Like, yeah, I'm supposed to be like laying low and I'm going to continue to stir the pot. Including antagonizing a guy he knows is both abusive to his wife and putting her into danger. Yep. That's what I thought about when that scene happened. I was like, wow, you really just like, you realize that she will be in danger automatically Mm -hmm. based on you interacting with her at all. And yeah, she knows that. And he does too, but like the, the way that he just doesn't care and then orders caviar and champagne to his room for one to leave her behind after he got the information he needed from her. Mm-hmm. And as soon as he comes back, she dead. 
Yeah. The callousness, like watching as a therapist, the callousness is like remarkable. And even with the love interest of this movie, Vesper, who like, quote unquote, like she's a very much like not like the other girl's energy, which I yeah. hate. Yeah. Not I love Eva Green and I love the way she plays her, but I can, it's just the way she's written. Um, And even her that he seems to be like holding above in terms of regard as soon as she in the poker game, as soon as she denies him what he wants, which is I'm not going to. Pay, like risk fifty million dollars for you buy back in. He grabs her by the arm pretty aggressively. He calls her an, a fucking idiot, I think, or a bloody idiot or something. Like, which is the, the equivalent of the f word. Yeah, in but just the way that he actually. flips on her mm-hmm. so suddenly and gets and she even says like you're hurting me and and the uh, that was really that really bothered me actually watching it and I was like oof like that really put me off of him but I think if we're thinking about in the context of having antisocial tendencies I'll put it like that before joining MI6 or the potential then it makes sense that that's part of it which is uh, the callousness of like the manipulation part which is like seeing sort of people as more means to an end Mm -hmm. other than like being full-fledged human beings so they know it's part of like the empathy part where it can just be harder to grab onto empathy when you're struggling with antisocial tendencies and so i think we see it in these moments where and i well i'm getting a little off track but i think that's also the part of where it's like he's a movie character where he shows a lot of empathy and sometimes like sitting on the shower floor with her Mm -hmm. but then other times he's so awful to her and other people and i mean it makes me a little I think now getting on like my feminist platform is like just that we romanticize characters like this who can flip on a dime so quickly on their female counterparts and how uh, like that's just a bad message, I guess, the long and the short of it. And it is a bad message and it's part of... I mean, it's of, abusive. It, mm-hmm. is, I mean, he, it is abusive and I think what, why I like this Bond so much is because they don't glorify his behavior as much. Like it's p- not presented in a way of the old Bond movies where just whatever Bond did was cool, and like yeah. however he acted was like a a thing that was you know had like peppy music or a little joke worked into it. Like the tone of this movie was entirely different, and he was not painted in a kind light. Like it was look at what he's doing, but also the way characters reacted to him wasn't oh it's just James being James. It's like wow, dude, you're an asshole actually like he he's yeah. presented with a, a realistic lens and not always favorable well it doesn't have that tongue-in-cheek joke at the end about something about you know that he i feel like in the old ones and i think i've i haven't seen very many bond movies in general but i think i've seen i think i saw some of the pierce brosnan ones um but even like there's always this like the insinuation about what he's doing and him having awareness of what he's doing to his female counterpart that they always have and kind of those you know those shitty jokes that make it seem okay the way that he's treating someone um and so i think you're right i think you're right i think it is and maybe it is why this this um, version of him really feels like unkind instead of like oh he's just you know being that's what James Bond does like he sleeps with the, you know any woman that he wants to and he like that's the appeal and that didn't feel the same mm-hmm. in this film no you could see the consequences of his actions on others on himself like he, he loses a little bit of himself each time he does one of these things yeah, because I think another part of this as well, you know, another like piece of it to add to the antisocial, which I think is how the job part weaves into it a lot, is that he definitely is having to put on a persona. And I think maybe because this is the first movie, like the first story in the whole Bond franchise, is him still getting figuring out that persona and what that persona looks like. But I think a clearer way that you see that persona kind of come on, at least I thought of it that way, is after he kills... Obano, the African terrorist guy, like him and his. No, no, no. Um, at, during the poker tournament. Oh, oh, when he oh, kills yeah. that guy and his bodyguard, the, like the head terrorist guy, yeah, and yeah. then yeah. he's in the bathroom and he's clearly like going through it, and then he like switches and then he's in a suit again and he's back to the poker table and he's like, <laughs> like him and his like martinis and like all that, you know. He's still, I think, figuring out how to split himself like that. And and maybe what we see in these other iterations is more like him kind of, unfortunately, like sort of mastering that better mm-hmm. of that switch kind of. 
which yeah. I don't know how realistic. I mean, it's not really realistic. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, the older Bonds, the, the Connerys and the Roger Moores mm-hmm. and some of the Brosnan too were flavored differently. The Timothy Dalton yeah. was flavored like this, but okay. the, the, he only got two movies because the world wasn't really ready for that. Mm. In the late eighties, like a not fun Bond. Uh, Timothy like Dalton a not was not. Bond. <laughs> he was not a fun Bond. Okay, his movies were not fun. They were rough and hard, and in the era of Opulence. Schwarzenegger <laughs> movies and yeah, um, Stallone movies, mm-hmm. Rambo's and Terminators and Eraser. I think well, maybe not Eraser yet, but like Total Recall, like the kinds of things. Flavor was different. The world wasn't really ready for a Bond like this. And yeah, like seeing that, like it. It lends to the argument like where a challenge would come in like, yes, he's definitely demonstrating all these antisocial traits, but we can also see that it is a mask and a persona that he adopts or it's a a part of him that he plays as opposed to something that feels like it is always just Mm -hmm. part of his demeanor, part of the way that he sees the world. Like he goes in and out of that and Vesper even calls him on it sometimes. So slapping the diagnosis on him isn't something that we can really do because you Like he shows these traits for sure, but like I was saying about the role that you have to play to do this requires that of you or you're going to die. Mm-hmm. And the stakes that he's playing at being at the level of SAS or, or MI6 and also having done SAS and being a military commander role in things, he's had to play at a bigger stake where the indi- life of an individual doesn't matter as much as the lives of tens of thousands, if not millions of people that can be mm. affected by whatever he's out doing. And Mm -hmm. for him to have to turn that on and off and figure out how to grapple with that makes, and that we see it, makes going like, yo, no, this guy's just definitely antisocial personality disorder. Like, uh, is it Patrick Bateman? Is that American American Psycho? Psycho. (laughs) Like seeing someone like that that has no remorse, that is actively preying and predatoring people for no purpose Mm. other Mm. than his own amusement. Absolutely. Bond is not doing that. Bond is about the mission. Yeah, I was going to say, because it's all, it's about the mission. He isn't making up his own missions. I mean, when he's kind of doing whatever the fuck he wants with the information that he has. Correct. But and he's not he's, a saint. <laughs> but he's but like but you're absolutely right. The big difference between him being the him being the one deciding what the mission should be and what it's and like yeah, it's it's I feel like <laughs> I feel like it's really hard to talk about it because it is so close in terms of really he's using skills that happen to be symptoms of of anti <laughs> yeah. antisocial personality disorder in order to do a job that he has to do and and therefore has awareness that that's what he's doing so like yeah. it's so different or it's so hard to kind of like um pull them apart from each other and kind of see but i think mm-hmm. but i think it's i think there are parts where he is humanizing and i think when we patrick bateman is a great example you know he's the bad guy the whole time (laughs) and that he doesn't and that he doesn't care that he's the bad guy and that he knows he's the bad guy and that he knows that he's the bad guy and i feel like that 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 the difference of the awareness that someone has to have that i just don't feel like he seems pretty messy and pretty unsure of himself in some ways and so yeah so I just think it's just hard to it's hard to pull mm-hmm. those apart and say, are is this a part of who he is, and that's why this works? Kind of what, what we've been saying the whole time. Which yeah, which it is. Yeah, and it yeah. has to be because I, I I work with with officers. I work with people who have been special forces. I work with people who are SWAT, like people who go into the danger to deal with the bad thing, mm-hmm. and like t- to get to know that the mentality it takes that you must already have to mm-hmm. be drawn to that. And generally speaking, usually people that get into these jobs are trying, like, not all of them, so it's not like a hard and fast rule, but people who get into jobs like that oftentimes either come from a family where that mentality is already part of their understanding of the world and it's been socialized to them their whole life, mm-hmm. or they're trying to correct a great wrong that happened to them or to their family and trying to assume power over the world by taking on the perceived bad people of the world and going on and doing these things. Take it there, Ben, who we talk about. Bruce Wayne, dude. God. Slam Come dunk, on, bro. You set you up. <laughs> I almost brought up a Batman reference of the well, night. Kept my mouth shut. Well, well we just talked similar... about Patrick Bateman, who is Batman, and Jim Gordon is Patrick Felix Slater is... in this movie. Yes. Patrick Bateman is kind of like Bizarro Batman, but um, Bruce Wayne. But 
I think what you guys are all referencing is like there's a higher moral good being being yes. parametered around this behavior of like there's a reason we're doing this. Kind of like the way that Batman like does that reasoning of like it's for justice and it's for like, you know, I'm, I'm doing good and like am I doing good? And so I think that's what makes it different. And also then he can he can also tell himself well, I'm doing it for a higher moral purpose. So all these like smaller indig- indignities, if we're going to even think of it like that, are worthwhile because I'm doing the world a service. Yeah. And so I can kill this person and I can fuck this woman, you know, and then she dies and then I'm lying to everybody and I'm, you know, I mean, he also smells like someone who has no personal life. And the fact that, like, oh, later no. in this movie, it feels like in order to have a personal life, I have to quit my job and run away. Yeah. Says a lot. Well, just like I Batman Bond is the re- mask. You know, like, the, the spy is the mask. That's true. Well, or I don't even the, know. That, that, or that, that what, whoever he is underneath becomes the mask. Like, Batman yeah. is, Bruce Wayne is Batman's mask, at, especially yeah. in the earlier parts of his life. Like, yeah. Because I don't think really Bond, and maybe this is really what is up with him is that he doesn't really have a personal life that's why when he has oh, no. when he's supposed to take downtime he's like downtime i don't know her and mm-hmm. he goes and like starts doing his own mission telling himself that it is the mission that he's already been given and like legitimizing it for himself which i think that would be diagnostically working for him like i'd want to dip more into that mm-hmm. yeah like so and that would make me a little bit more oof, like the antisocial tendencies of like maybe a bit stronger. Cause I'd be like, so you were given opportunity to just lay low, take care of yourself, do your thing. And it's like, why, what was driving you to continue to engage in, in work that would allow you to lean into these behaviors? Could you not take a break from these behaviors? Do you need to fulfill that part of you? Or is it the higher yeah. moral mission you can walk away from and you have no light meaning outside of it? Yada, yada, yada. Well, because I, because part of what I feel like is, that he could have just given M the information that he had mm. because he got that information because he got that information. Yes. He had an international stunt for it um, and, <laughs> and made some maybe not great choices for sure. I was like the first, my th- first thought was he's at the embassy. You can't do anything now. I was like, what is oh. happening right now? <laughs> but, um, but the fact that, <sighs> yeah, um, deep sigh, deep sigh. <laughs> Fuck. That's a he. he that, just, that's a bingo square. Yeah. <laughs> you watched it. Your is. I did. I did. Yeah. Just how? What was I even talking about? <laughs> Shit. That's a great question. <laughs> but I mean, that's I, two bingo squares. I don't know if we, we've been kind of already been referencing it, and we can kind of weave this into the discussion we're having is like the trauma of this job. So I also wonder too, how much of what drives him is un like unidentified trauma wait wait like, wait hold on hold on wait, wait before we go there there's yeah. something i want to point out before what? we get into the trauma part is that we're talking about the personality disorders and like these very mm-hmm. specific things that make it really difficult for us to track is this this or is yeah. this that which is a game we play it's called differential diagnosing where yep. you figure out but one of the things I know we've mentioned it before, but I'm going to tie it in right now because why is it that Bond won't take downtime and we figure out they're like, this mission is about me. I'm the only one who can solve that (laughs) because there is a thing called personality disorder clusters Mm -hmm. and antisocial personality and narcissistic personality histrionic (laughs) and histrionic (laughs) and borderline are all in the same cluster, which is cluster Mm -hmm. B. Yeah. Which... When we see that, cluster B disorders involve unpredictable, dramatic, or intensely emotional responses to things. And so when we look at Bond's behavior, while we can't clearly just diagnose him with antisocial personality disorder due to all of the cultural reasons of his job and his work, we can see enough behaviors in him that the question mark remains that there are so many cluster B traits within you yeah, that... You're not absolved either. Yeah, like either way, he's not engaging with the world in an adjusted sense. And even she says, I mean, Vesper puts it very succinctly. MI6 looks for maladjusted young men who give little thought to sacrificing others for queen and country. And also like with the draw, I literally wrote Ben in my notes. So dramatic Mm -hmm. in capital letters (laughs) with two exclamation points. Yeah. And I think you're bringing up an interesting point too, which is... 
which we'll talk about more with Vesper, like relationship with Vesper is like the way, which I think is when I see people with cluster B personality disorders, I think something I notice a lot across the board ish is sort of flipping in the sense of, um, and I think it gets talked about mostly in, with like borderline personality, but like either this is all good or this is all bad. It's really hard to live in like the gray Mm-hmm. or the nuance and I think it does make more sense to me now with him because he goes from like queen and country I'll kill anybody for anything mission 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 I'll fuck up everything and anybody and like it's all like so narrow minded focused then he flips and he's like you know what I'm going to quit my job I'm going to move away to Venice with this girl that I just met bro like just met I'm going to tell her that I love her I'm going to get super attached to her I'm going to like be a whole other person and I was like this makes no sense because Maybe this is just bad screenwriting. No offense, whoever wrote this movie, but like they don't plant any seeds in the first half of this movie that he's looking for a way out. Nope. That he's wanting to be a different person. Like she points it out and he repeats her, which is this is all your life you have or something. And he just he says something about like getting out of this life and then he repeats it back to her later. But I'm like, but he didn't have that thought. And so it really felt so dramatic and goofy, <laughs> to be quite honest, when he totally flips after when he's um, rehabilitating and wants to do something totally different. Like that doesn't really align. But if we're thinking about it through like the lens of like cluster B, like personality, there is, there can be the ten- the tendency to work in extremes. And mm-hmm. we do see that in this movie. He's like oscillating from like one extreme to the next. And then as soon as she dies, he's like, he calls her, a, that bitch is dead, which ugh, really hurt my heart. And then he's like full blown back in a suit, gun on his hip, like, Bond is back, baby. So it's still one extreme to the other extreme, back to the first extreme. Which just absolutely nails it from the clinical point of view of like, well, we can't get a firm finger on what makes you who you are and what you are, but we can sure as shit clearly say that there are obvious cluster B traits that are a part Mm -hmm. of his personality that allows him to do what he does. Does it rise to the level of we can clearly diagnose you with this personality disorder no Mm -hmm. but does it say that in order to be selected for a job like this you must believe that somebody has to already have elevated levels on these traits Mm -hmm. and that the tipping point is so so narrow for Mm -hmm. what we see like put these people in these situations and then the bosses, the M's and above her don't have so much concern for what happens to them because, well, that's what they signed up for and that's who we selected because Mm -hmm. that's who we need to complete our mission. Mm -hmm. But this, before we jump into the trauma point of this, this feels like a good spot to take a break. In 2019, a world champion debater went head to head with a computer program designed by IBM. A debate topic was announced, and each side had just 15 minutes to prepare. In testing, the computer program had proven it could persuade people to actually change their minds about all sorts of issues. But could this artificial intelligence system come up with compelling arguments that would persuade more people than an accomplished human debater could? To find out, check out episode 50 of my podcast, Opinion Science. I'm Andy Luttrell, and I'm a social psychologist who studies people's opinions and when they change. On Opinion Science, I talk to social scientists and professional communicators to get to the bottom of how we form opinions, how we express them, and how we can be convinced to change them. So go to opinionsciencepodcast.com and subscribe to Opinion Science for new episodes every other week. I think you'll like it, but that's just my opinion. All right, so capital T, everybody say it with me, trauma. I think kind of what you were saying, Ben, that this movie is trying to do something different than the other Bond movies. And before we started recording, we were talking about how the Bourne movie came out, the first Bourne identity came out years before. And I remember like reading stuff and hearing stuff about how that movie kind of changed the style of action movies, like the fight scenes. Like that movie was pretty revolutionary in terms of how it changed the game action-wise. And so very much so. this Bond, I think, is a direct reflection of that and him not being like the swarthy sort of like Roger Moore, like sip a martini and like loosen my tie. And then I like, like if I don't get the 5 million buy-in, I would just, you know, he, in those movies, he would have just seduced Vesper or like used his wiles to like get the money yeah. out of her. And she would have been like, what? And like a post-orgasmic case been like, where did that money go? And her name <laughs> would be like, you know, 
femme Tense vagina McGee. or something. Well, the Roger Tense Moore McGee. movies. <laughs> Roger Moore for sure would have done that. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Her name would have been like Pussy Galore. <laughs> no, it would have been like an accountant pun. Like, oh, you're right, you're right, you're right. I don't even know. You'll think of one. <laughs> I know you will. Right, like hottie coin purse. Oh my god! <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> it would have been something. It would have been like bad. like tipsy numbers or something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. It, it would totally. Have been right. But you're, you're right. Like the. <laughs> Connery would have like done it like a Bella Lugosi, but like supposed to be sexy, like stare thing, and like been like what? Oh God! And just been like, but look at me, I'm <laughs> I'm so attracted to you. I can't remember anything about myself. And then yeah, get the then fuck out of here. <laughs> like Roger Moore would have been just so much suaveness and like charisma. That's like you look at it now and like all that like weird seventies and early eighties like grossness, just like all over it. It's just mm-hmm. it's like smarmy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it just it's like Whoa. but this this one was uh different and it did it changed born changed a lot about how we look at these heroes and what their yeah. lives are like and that there's a cost to the hero and it's not mm-hmm. just like look at this shining example of masculinity that all guys should strive to be because then you'll just be getting laid all that you want and just be just slaying it out there and like mm-hmm. women will be throwing it at you and like that's mm-hmm. That, that would, that's what Bond was. That's what mm-hmm. a whole generation of people that grew up on Bond was and why some people rejected this movie because they're like, oh, I don't like this Bond. He's too serious. It's not fun. That's not what I go see a James Bond movie for. And you're like, but this is good. <laughs> this is real. It's, I mean, I guess you could argue like more responsible storytelling in that like it actually demonstrates like the cost of doing this work. And Absolutely. I, but I, also I wonder if that's what makes this story feel a little clunky. In the in, yeah. in the writing of it, and that they're trying to insert like groundedness and reality within a franchise that that works off of being almost like cartoony, like superhero kind of like next level stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah, like yeah. that shiny slick spy shit. And so yeah. this movie is trying to inject born level like reality into it. And so we do get moments that are clearly like trauma based, like we've mentioned after he kills that guy and his bodyguard that moment where he's in his hotel room and he's taking off his like bloody clothes and he's trying to clean himself up and he's like like washing his face and he downs a whole like tumbler of like something like scotch or whiskey of some form and you can see him just like staring at himself in the mirror and i was like he is trying to get he's trying to recalibrate Mm -hmm. and his brain wants to go somewhere else Oh yeah, he's dissociating hard. Yeah, mm-hmm. at that point, he's and he's trying to get back into where he can activate his super spy part, and his his fight parts, and contain himself and isolate out the parts of his personality that are really him, the real James. Mm-hmm. And you see that looking in the mirror, and you're exactly right. He's trying to recontain that yeah. so that he can activate the parts of himself that don't have access to that part of him at all and mm-hmm. I freeze that right out so he can go back to doing whatever he has perceived he needs to do. Yeah. And what's what's also impossible about that is you can see that through the course of the poker game where all this crazy stuff happens, like he gets poisoned, he like has to get defibrillated and all this shit, that his, his veneers the veneer is starting to crack. Like when later when that guy's like asking about his martini and he's like, I don't give a fuck. Like how you do the martini just give it to me right now. Like, yeah. <laughs> like he which might be because this is early Bond in the narrative of Bond, or just because this movie's trying to have a different vibe to it. Yeah. Is you really do see that he keeps trying to snap back into this persona yeah. and he is struggling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. The deeper he goes into the hole and like the more stuff he has to do like the moments where you see real James try to break through and go like, dude, you got to reckon with what the fuck just happened to you. Mm -hmm. And he's like, nah, with mission, Mm -hmm. you see the struggle. And that's where like the, the more groundedness, the more consequence based, responsible storytelling, whichever way you want to put it, that started with born. And like, you saw it a little bit in the first born. And by the third one, you like, they, that was the whole plot. Like, look what happened to him to Mm -hmm. make him into this weapon. Yeah. And you see Bond openly call M on that and be resentful of it of, do you know what I've had to do to earn this double O status? Like, I have to get two kills? I have to kill two people to like even being, be on these missions. It's like being initiated into a gang. 
kind of you have to kill that part of you sort of Mm -hmm. and it normalizes behavior and then you feel Mm -hmm. like you have this is all you can do now because you've crossed a line that quote-unquote normal people Mm -hmm. don't cross that you're now irredeemable Mm -hmm. which is a serious component of trauma work is dealing with the guilt and the shame over what had to be done by the right brain emotional parts that the left brain logical parts could not do. Your core personality, the part of you that loves your children, that hugs your wife, that throws your kid up in the air and answers to the word daddy, cannot go out and brutally murder people. And to find that part in you and realize that that is in me and was in me and is in all of us is a lot of reckoning to do. And you see him struggle with that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, yeah, you're right. He does have this interesting dynamic with M, which I know of like grows over the course of these movies with him, with Bo- with Daniel Craig's Bond. And it's like, it always feels like, this is a little bit sidebar, like, does M stand for mommy? Because I feel like that's a slight like psychological thing because they definitely have a mommy-esque, I don't know. It always feels like he's mad at his mom when he's coming at her for something. Yeah, well, and I also think that she also acts like an abusive mother. Like in terms of like one of the things that she says to him, she doesn't say it's all your fault that this happened. But she says, she says the trail has run cold. Mm. And he doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And she's like, so we just don't have anything now. And I just don't know what we're going to do. And it's like, yep, that's saying to him, you're the one who fucked this up. He knows exactly, and you can you can see it in his face if you watch that. That's him having over like a traumatic response, or like a maybe maybe trauma response is too big, but maybe having like um, being triggered back into that part of himself mm-hmm. because the way that she that she has that conversation with him, it really feels like again, which kind of what we've been talking about this whole time, which is where she's doing what she has to in order to get the performance that she needs out of him. Ugh, which that is which is horrible uh, yeah. for a billion different reasons but i think that that is i think that's why their relationship is is kind of the way it is and i and i don't know if her relationship with every person with every double oh seven whatever the fuck <laughs> with the, every with everyone agent, that yeah. she works with if that's always the case but my guess would be is that's a little bit different with everybody i think it's exactly what it has to be to get the job done yeah yeah yeah. it's more that that's like the ultimate goal sorry ben go ahead it's okay like m stands for missions like they're they're they're, oh get the fuck out of here they're the uh, uh, so m is played by different people throughout the roles because yeah which i know ray fines is still m Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, whoever played m in all the other ones which was consistent for several movies kind of like alfred um was (laughs) where Michael Goff played him, but the recognition of any military commander or police commander or paramilitary anything is going to have to recognize that they're playing chess Mm -hmm. and that these pieces may not be pawns, but they're not the queen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's a knight. He's a bishop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that those are pieces that you have to be able to manipulate and move into the situations they need to be in to perform the role they need to do, including at their own peril. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is going to require her to have to dissociate into roles herself. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But like recognizing that that role can be pretty complicated and messed up for a person like Bond who has already had a complicated life and striving to please and to connect to and earn the approval of and the attention of that he's going to act out to get it. And then mm-hmm. to manipulate that in order to get him to do the role, like well, that's the job. But also, when you look at it through the lens of what does that do to someone's mental health, like yeah, oof, mm-hmm. it gets dicey fast. Mm-hmm. It really does. Mm-hmm. Oof. And it, I mean, I guess and there's oh, go and, ahead. Anna. Yeah, sorry. One more thing, and that there's only so much that a one human can take. Mm-hmm. Regardless, until the mental health piece becomes so overwhelming that you have to deal with it. Right. Which. Looking at, at Bond, the signs of trauma you're going to see is like put him into perspective. Like we only get bits of his history essentially through the conversation with Vesper on the train. Yes. That he mm-hmm. is Oxford educated, mm-hmm. but he didn't fit in there. Mm-hmm. So he, and she dresses him down like you were an orphan. Mm-hmm. Essentially, you were orphaned at some point where you had to be reminded constantly that you didn't fit in. You have a chip on your shoulder. There's something to prove. Mm-hmm. 
that you SAS types basically in order to get that you have to what does what does SAS stand for special air service sorry okay go ahead um so the the navy seals of british that makes more sense now Mm -hmm. okay yep sorry with the things that they have to do to get selected for that like we see jason Bourne go through that and sas like selection for that is tough just like We've we've seen Navy SEAL trainings in lots of movies like GI Jane or mm-hmm. you know the ass clonery mm-hmm. that is Navy SEALs. But <laughs> um, I remember like Hugh Grant. I love to listen to a commentary track on a DVD, y'all. Hugh Grant, when on the commentary track for Love Actually, talked about because he plays Prime Minister in that movie. He talks about how he actually has like he was at a like a dinner party or something or like a party at someone's house where the spouse of one of the women was SAS or formerly SAS and he fell asleep on the couch and she was the only one that could wake him because there's a very specific way you have to wake up a SAS person so they don't basically like attack you I guess because of all the training they've gotten and like the trauma probably as well and you have to wake them up in a very specific way right I mean they're black ops yeah like their job is to go behind enemy lines and do whatever whatever they have to be done yeah in, which is often up close and personal with knives. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, like one one of the when I did my ride along, the sergeant I was with was Team Recon Marine, which is the Marines equivalent, and you know, just his stories alone about what had to be done and with what fucked up stuff people mm-hmm. have to do in order to become this. You not only have to be the best of the best, the most elite, the most fit, the smartest. But you also have to be the meanest motherfucker among the meanest motherfuckers Mm -hmm. to get this job. And he's been through all of that before he became, when he was a single O agent, before he became double O. Mm -hmm. So you see like all that he's had to do and sacrifice to become Mm -hmm. a double O agent Mm -hmm. already has worn on him. And he carries it with him. And then to have to do more with a short life expectancy, you see... these signs of residual grief, guilt, shame that leak out of him in some brilliant acting by Daniel Craig every now and again, that he's actually got some issues with what had to be done and some pretty serious resentment over what he's had to do to become the blunt instrument. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's also the trauma part of it, obviously, as well as that you guys, I think he clearly, you can tell that he understands that the system is taking advantage of the parts of him that they benefit Need. from. Mm-hmm. And then they will abandon him. Like they'll drop him like fourth period French as soon as he is too much trouble. I think that was really kind of like the point that I felt like he was trying to make with to M after the embassy thing mm-hmm. of like, well, you guys like when I do this kind of flashy ass shit that gets shit done. But as soon as I do my own thing and it fucks it up a little bit, you want to drop me. But. You can't drop me. Like, like I get his anger. I mean, it kind of, this is a weird reference, but it kind of reminds me of like in Hunger Games at the very end of the first Hunger Games movie when Kato has that moment, like monologue at the end where he's like, my whole life I've been trained to do this and they didn't really tell me how, how disposable I actually am. Like I've been made to feel special and I'm really disposable. Yeah. And that's like, that is like Good identity parallel. wise, like so traumatizing. Like that is, and so it, I guess if I'm thinking about it from like an attachment standpoint and a trauma standpoint, kind of where we're going to like go next with this topic is like him kind of imprinting on Vesper, (laughs) like a duck, like a baby duck in that she's different. And I guess I think a clear signifier, I mean, they have the little tete-a-tete on the train, which I think gives them a hard on, but like, Oh, it does. Yeah. Because they're like, I'm not like other girls. Um, also, but I think have you seen Eva Green? Because she's like an alien, and and I mean that as a compliment. Like she's like a beautiful person that came from another planet. Like truly, I love Eva her. Green. Like she her. just looks cool. Like I look at her, I'm like, God damn, you're she's cool. She's very unique looking. She's but she's French. She's very French. Ridiculously <laughs> gorgeous. Yes. Yeah. And I think what really. I think they become trauma bonded. Like when I think the kind of pivotal moment for him really is after they kill those guys. Well, he kills those guys with her and she's, he finds her in the shower 
on the ground, which makes sense to me. I think she's like fully like her own dissociation, like trauma response. Well, it looks like she had dropped the wine glass. Yeah, maybe she was and a just like mm-hmm. maybe was having a panic attack or and then got in the shower or just like, had I a gotta... trauma response, which would be totally normal yeah. and natural in this situation. Oh yeah, that's a full for, on dis- for anyone full on panic attack and dissociative episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what and I it's I when assumed. you make those crazy decisions, like not crazy in the sorry to use that term, but like where you're like I have to get in the shower, like I have to take all my clothes off. Like I think when you get in that panic moment you're like i need something i i'm suffocating or i need something to feel different right now in this moment yeah and he does do a good job i mean i think what he does do well is instead of like he just kind of meets her where she is where she's at like he sits in the shower and he just holds her and he makes the shower warmer and like he doesn't really try to like talk her out or like belittle her like I mean, he does suck on her fingers, which I do not understand. <laughs> like, that is his weird, like, I think the personality stuff where I'm like, do you know how to be uh, a mallet, uh, like an, ad- like a, I don't want to use the word normal. <laughs> do you like know how to be, do you know how to show affection appropriately well, it, and not I, make I, it weirdly intimacy, sexual? Not I, I can make explain it weirdly it. sexual. I can explain it. It's, it's still weird. I'm not going to defend that it's not, <laughs> but I think. Okay, go ahead. I'm, 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 going, I'm going to make Hannah proud here. And I'm going to do it on purpose. I'm going to make Hannah proud. That scene (laughs) is very similar to the peach scene in Call Me By Your Name. Okay. What prompts him to do that is that she says, I can't get the blood off my hands. Even though she's already clearly washed it off, she can't get it off. And he shows her, like, by putting her fingers that proceeds to be covered in blood in his mouth, he's showing her, like, you are still acceptable you are clean enough that i can do this even though it's the most fucking weird bizarre flex i, I possible like he's you're not going to put somebody's bloody fingers in your mouth and be like you're you're okay he's doing that to like take a weird paternal flex and also like kiss the wound but also show her that she's not unclean now that she's not yeah but like kind of like with the the yeah, yeah, super yeah. gross disgusting peach scene that felt exactly like that to me of like what in the fuck yeah. was that mm-hmm. yeah. um, but it's it was exactly the same thing like you're not dirty you're not gross mm-hmm. you're not broken because you know you did this like it's mm-hmm. but isn't it also we're the same like him saying that to her mm-hmm. in that, with that gesture no, and I'm only no. saying that because in call me by your name that's kind of what it's saying yeah Two. I, you're not wrong yeah. about what you said at all and I am proud of you <laughs> Um, <laughs> you were correct, but I think in I think that's the only difference that I can see. So I just want to know what you two think. Like, do you think that that was the that part was the same? That this is also of like, mm, I think it's I think this is me making a, like a hypothesis. Is that I think he puts people in boxes. I think his job requires that, and so I wouldn't be surprised if he does what a lot of unfortunately a lot of you know, male presenting, like, well, cis men do, which is, like, mother whore dynamic. Yeah. Of, like, you're either, like, my mommy, or you're, like, a clean little virgin girl, or you're, like, a slut, slut, slutty mix, slut, slut. And so I think, I think he struggles to not engage with women either as, like, maternalistic, like he does with M, or as, like, sexual objects. And so I wonder, too, if, like, the sucking of the fingers is sort of him also, like, I think maybe he has a hard time not making it a little sexy. <laughs> like, you know, and making it a little sexual in nature. Nope. Like, because of his... I think of how he engages with women on a regular basis. I mean... That's just me floating out a, an idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean... Yeah. You sort of like it's a like to make it weirdly sexual fits within the ethos of Bond and the rationale. I can see it sort of. I think yeah. mostly I disagree with it that that scene wasn't supposed to be sexy. That was supposed to be more mm-hmm. of I'm showing you you're not dirty now like that. Yeah. Because the way. But like, I think it's, but I think like it's still trying to put him in a sexy light though. Like, I mean maybe. Because I thought it was sexy when I first watched the movie and I was like 22. And now that I'm much older and a therapist, I was like, what <laughs> are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it's, it, I mean, probably Bond has to have some degree of weird sex dominance things. that. But for me watching it this time, I was watching it going like, I mean, he's, he's trying. That's like the most human we see him. Mm-hmm. Is where he's like trying to show her, you know, like, you're not, you're not broken now. And is it like we're the same? In the same in that like I killed the guy and you watched me and you I helped just, that. I just think he was trying to show her affection and tenderness in a moment when she was feeling very vulnerable and upset like I think he genuinely was just trying to like be kind I think it's more 
I think it's well, more. Well, he's obviously he's, clearly like falling in love with her, I guess. <laughs> like no. if I'm trusting the narrative of the well, story. Well, I mean, sure. Like if he can establish some kind of sexual contact with her because she's been freezing him out. No, but I don't think he's doing that on purpose. I think that he is genuinely like feels affectionate towards her mm, and yes. also sees her in a vulnerable. And I mean, and the word, I'm not using vulnerable like in a prey predator way. I mean, like she's just upset. Like I think she's, he sees that she's very like, like fragile. She's, well, I mean, she, in I'm not trying thing. to screen him like a villain at this moment. I think he's genuinely no. trying to be kind to her. And no, like, I know. Yeah. yeah. What I, I mean, like in that like mother horror virginal thing, like uh-huh. he's trying to help her preserve the virginal. Cause she's, yeah, she's, I agree. She's I agree. frozen him out. So in order for her to be within those three simplistic kind of places, yeah. she has, even though she's a sex object to him, she's consistently she's made it quite clear that you're not getting none of this basically. Yeah. Even though when she put mm-hmm. that, that dress on, like, the whole world stopped and continues to stop every that time that comes ugly. on. That I, hate, I hate that dress. Yeah, that dress was very 2006 prom, though, so I can get why it might have been good at the time. Yeah. Because also the other woman's dress was pretty ugly. The pink one in the very beginning. That was, yeah, a similar kind of weird It's similar, style. very, like, 2006. Like, everything just, was like, satin and it didn't need to be. Yeah, and also just, like, t- too many weird things. Like, then it was a tie. A ribbon and a gemstone. It was like, like, yeah, <laughs> it was like, stop trying to do all the things. But, but Eva Green in that dress. I mean, Eva Green can do whatever she Eva wants. Eva Green in anything is good. Well, exactly. Yeah. So she was in that dress. So, you know. Yeah. I did like but her little made, thing with him where point. she was like, I have a dinner jacket. She was like, they're dinner jackets. And then there are dinner jackets. And I was like, I liked that. And she was like, this is the latter. And I was like, that's a great line. Well, she was bonding bond. And he was like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it's probably the moment he fell in love with her though he just went like he was yeah Touché, i'm gonna I go stare out a window about this holding a tumbler of scotch <laughs> <laughs> I, I think jack um and 30 rock says that i'm gonna go stare out a window about this. <laughs> <laughs> but yet like recognizing just like that that dynamic between the two of them is so weird and also like the whole thing that he can't crack her because mm-hmm. she's got her game face on the entire film. Well, yeah, because she's double agent, basically. Well, she's no, she's being she's not double blackmailed. agent, but she's being blackmailed. She's not being honest. Like she's yeah. putting on her own. She's not persona. being honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's not being honest with him. Mm-hmm. But that appeals to him that he that she remains a conquest and is <sighs> a thing of interest, which Barf. that for Bond makes you know that's traditionally been. Like the women that most get his attention, regardless of who's playing him, is the women that can change. Like Fam K. Janssen's uh, Zenya on a top. Like, <laughs> see, there's the ridiculous What's her name? Zenya on a top. On a top. On a t- <laughs> whose killer move is to d- suffocate men and black widow them with her thighs. I have heard that. Yeah, wasn't Denise Richards' neuroscientist character called like Doctor Christmas? Christmas Jones. There you go. <laughs> Which the ending line of the movie as it fades out is, I thought Christmas only came once a year. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wow. These movies are really like, women, sure, you're there. (laughs) Right? And I want to like put something in your holes every now and then. So I'll let you be a, be a character with a dumbass name. This oh is stupid God. as shit. Yeah, that that so one was stupid. particularly bad. That that yeah. one was uh, the one with oh. Sophie Marceau as the villain, and also whatever the guy's name is who played Rumpelstiltskin in Once Upon a Time. Oh. Oh. Robert something? Oh, who cares? From uh, Train Spotting. <laughs> who was g- glorious, but so corny and tacky. But <laughs> anyway, Hello, Mr. Bond, like that kind of energy. <laughs> no, no, no. He was. He was. The, a, a I am damaged Russian that does not have does not feel oh. pain due to bullets in my brain, oh, so I no. can act however I want, and you cannot hurt me. Oh, no. Like really, like that. Barf, it was that. Barf, but Rooney. anyway, before we get on a tangent of all the 27, <laughs> oh, yeah, 25 just, Bond movies, yeah. mm-hmm. um, like so recognizing just Vesper. like this this relationship with Vesper is complicated for so many reasons. But seeing like why Bond is drawn to her mm-hmm. is a fascinating component of this film. Mm-hmm. And Hannah's making weird hands. Are we gonna take me. a break? Is that what you're trying to do over there? <laughs> oh, oh God. Um, we'll take a break. All right. 
Yeah. So in talking about relationship with Vesper, we've already been touching upon it. And like, I think the word trauma bond is also being used a lot lately Mm -hmm. on the tick and the talk. Like I've been hearing that word used a lot more in mainstream culture lately. And what do we mean when we say trauma bond? It basically just means that you and somebody else went through something really traumatic together. And because of that, it creates a elevate and like an accelerated intimacy um, in your relationship. That's kind of how I define it. But you guys can clarify if you disagree with any of that definition. I think... Or if I you want to layer on it. Yeah, I think that if both of the people are having the trauma done to them at the same time, mm-hmm. but also sometimes you can become trauma bonded to someone who is hurting you as well. well exactly, yeah, that's a good so, point. So it doesn't always... It's not always how it is. It's not always how it is in um in that way. Like it's not only where they're both having something happen to them, which is how I think it's talked yeah. about on TikTok. Is like they both had the same bad experience, and so now they're trauma bonded. It mm-hmm. also can happen, but but you did say relationship in general, so it also mm-hmm. can happen when um, someone is traumatized. Um, or is being traumatized by someone Mm -hmm. and then they become bonded to that person. A lot of times because um, I think there's another added piece to it where I think a part of that has to do with someone they know. Mm -hmm. I think which really can create the dynamic that's weird. So I don't know necessarily, I don't know, I don't think that that's the version you're talking about. I feel like, and not the version we're talking about in this film, for sure. I think the important thing to remember with trauma bonds is why do police want to hang out with police? Why do veterans want to hang out with veterans? They get it. Because they get it. (laughs) Because the trauma bond is created when the assumption that no one else has been through what mm-hmm. we have or understands what it does to you to become what you become after this happened. Mm-hmm. So people who are survivors of things always have like a kindred spirit with people who have also survived the same thing because nobody else understood and you can't explain what you had to become to survive that. And mm-hmm. that can also include a really fucked up manipulated version of being bonded to the person hurting you because now I'm so broken that no one else can love me. So whatever love that this person is giving me in the fucked up way that I'm getting it is all that I'm ever going to get. Yeah. So I have to stay here and take this because I'm so fucked because this happened to me that I can't be loved by anybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it can happen sort of like relationally, like, we are parallels in this or it can happen like power dynamic like top bottom abuser abused Mm -hmm. and so i think if i didn't know if like part of the story wasn't vesper being like being a persona like i'm gonna say double agent i don't think of a better word like she's a double agent double agent in her own regard yeah the only thing i way i could make sense of their relationship is that they did have a bit of that like sort of like trauma bonding because like they don't know each other they know each other for days i think maybe weeks but I think more days. Yeah. Before when he's like in the, I wrote down solarium because I couldn't really think of like <laughs> what they was at because it was like it was like a hospital, but it was also like a garden and like a like a beautiful resort, like palatial. I was like, it just made me think of like old school, like oh, we're going to visit your mother at the sanitarium energy. Yeah. Well, like I mean, they're using that wheelchair. <laughs> they're in the Mediterranean. I mean, yeah, it was very the world's um, different there. Swanky and like the way that she's like holding his hand like right after the fact and the way that like he says I love you and they're so intimate and like they're just like talking about the rest of their lives together like the level of intimacy they adopt with each other so quickly makes no sense and and now that I kind of know that she was working her own like angle like she had a means to an end that she was trying to accomplish like it all makes more sense to me not quite him glomming onto her so quickly yeah that is more I think what we've already covered with like the cluster B yeah traits um, and also like attachment stuff because like I said we don't really know enough yet about his parentage like growing up and so like his attachment issues with that of like I finally see someone who seems to really like genuinely get me and like be affectionate towards me and not the James Bond me but like the James Bond me like the underneath me James and not Bond and so like I'm going to like throw everything into this basket with her and it just is was wild it was like that whole part of the, that whole chunk of that movie I know it's just supposed to be like splash and romantic but I was like making the wildest face of the TV I was like they're so affectionate so intimate so quickly in a way that makes no sense well it makes sense when you look at her remembering she's still 
at a means to an end. And yeah, that exactly. when he is being tortured and he's saying to the right, to the right, that what's also happening is that Vesper is making a deal that is being communicated to Mr. White and Quantum mm-hmm. that she'll get the money, but the only way you're going to get the money, he's not going to crack. He's mm. not going to tell you he will get chopped up into bits before he tells you a yeah. goddamn thing. And if you want your money, I will get it for you, but you have to... Which is why they save them. He doesn't shoot him. They, that's why they live through that. That's why right. they That's why they live through it. Like other, and Bond, because he's got his cluster B things and the narcissism and things like... And also, he is severely traumatized and uh, wounded and dissociated because <laughs> he's yeah. having laugh, his but. balls beaten in with a giant rope knot. <laughs> Um, oh, that was brutal, dude. I was like, I I can't imagine watching that as a person who owns balls. Um, 100%. Look, well, at the time this movie came out, I still had two of them. So I, I will <laughs> <laughs> speak to that. And, and then you got tortured by that guy. And now we're where we're at. <laughs> and every one of us that owns it, once they cut that thing out of the chair, went, what Ooh. is this business? And put them on it naked and went, oh, no. And then you see the rope and you go, oh, oh no, I oh didn't, no. I didn't get it until until he had the rope in his hand and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be bad, guys. So, so that first thump. But the little one, the little like, little tap, like those hurt more usually because mm-hmm. the other ones, it takes some time for the blood to flow back mm-hmm. in, but that little tap, you feel, those are the ones that are the worst. <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah, I've it's, heard true. That. Mm-hmm. it's It's true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, but uh, the, anyway, anyway, like, yeah, as, as a representative owner of uh, said parts, yeah, um, whew, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's one of yeah. the most cringeworthy torture scenes you've ever seen in a movie, and it, it shows to Lashif's narcissism mm-hmm. and, and yeah. wickedness of, like, mm-hmm. I will do whatever to you, and just talk to you about what's happening like he, you know <laughs> Mads Mikkelsen was great in that he's yeah he's just a great him. actor yeah, right? he's Mads always Mikkelsen. good mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Every everybody time. watch Hannibal the TV show thank you every time he's always good but like looking at at that remember like Bond is so dissociated and like gets hit in the head and is not not but, able to process I mean, like he's not able to connect the details of what's going on with Vesper that how did you get out of this like a logical person is not going to look at that and go oh well this organization just came in and killed everybody and left us like come on dude like you didn't get rescued by MI6 like they left you he gets in this he gets in this weird like almost like fairy it's like maybe he has been hit in the head too one too many times because like it's almost like he gets in this fairy tale persona where like her name is the password to the thing and like and I don't know it's like he wants to just be a different person after that happens which I mean could be like trauma response it getting hit in, is. his heart could almost be, exploding several times it could, uh, I mean it poisoned it, <laughs> Yeah, well, and it could also be... Beheaded. It could also be that if you haven't had... So, because we're talking about attachment, yeah. right? So, we're assuming that he probably hasn't had a um, secure attachment. Mm-hmm. Regardless, we don't know... I don't remember the details for sure. But also, we certainly don't know that in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, but that we already know that his attachment probably is either insecure or is um, anxious or what is the other one? I'm so good, bad at knowing these. I know. And I look it's it up avoidant. every time. Avoidant. 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 I would say probably he's, he smells like avoidant. Yeah. He's, he's avo- anxious avoidant. He's yeah. anxious avoidant. Yeah. He's like that both that like, Mm-hmm. So also push and pull. They can't see your hands, bro. So oh, I mean, <laughs> you're right. They cannot see my hands. Yes, he's he's the push and the pull. The anxious avoidant. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Hannah. Um, but that what we see too. So a couple of different things. So one, it could literally just be all the trauma that he's just experienced and having your life um, flash before your eyes like and having times. somebody that you exactly <laughs> and having somebody that you care about being a part of that or knowing that this, this is happening. Like I think in some ways, like that def- that could happen to anyone. Where like you're, mm-hmm. where you go so hard to have something normal, and she's of already like, seen like the horrible things you've done, and she still likes you exactly. Like, and so I think that that's a part of it. And also, too, when we think about 
what kinds of relationships he must have had growing up or the what reason why he's avoidant, anxious avoidant, is also that the way that he experiences relationships and connection is not going to be like the romance story that we see. Well, to be perfectly honest, the romance stories that we see are trash anyway. Um, <laughs> that probably would be exactly what he would expect. Um, but just in terms of like having big emotions and having big positive emotions, like kind of also riding on that experience of endorphins if he hasn't had a lot of healthier relationships in his life. Mm -hmm. So, and that can be on a roller coaster for somebody who a, who is experienced a lot of trauma Mm -hmm. Uh, that could be a part of their experience too. So it could be, I mean, it could be a little bit of both, but I feel like, I feel like his response makes so much sense to me in terms of how he, how they go through all of that stuff. And then all of a sudden he's like, I'm out, I'm in love with you. Let's let's go and live this life together. together. Yeah. Well, it makes total sense to me too, and for a couple factors, all those things you mentioned, also the things we're not talking about or processing that didn't even click in my head until right now. He got a head injury. Yeah. Yeah. He survived a near death experience. Yeah. He, he almost lost his balls. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a second. But ding, also. Ding, ding. What state is Bond in when we see him in the sanitarium? He's like in a wheelchair. He's like a little old man. Which means he is on what? An opiate. Medication. There we go. (laughs) Fuck. There we go. So he might feel high on life and high on opiates during all this? He's high as shit. That's a good point. And how do you feel? And he's acting like kind of goofy for him, like sort of like love sick, like hard eyes energy. Yeah. With her, yeah, he's very just like, which also could be him like. Now that you're bringing that up, Ben, it's connecting dots with me, like conflating the feeling of being high on opiates with also being in love with her. He's high on opiates. Yeah, and he's just like living it. He's like, yes, 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 yes. I mean, like he's he's high. He's high on opiates, and he's he is. We we see how like his vision isn't clear. He's not sure what's real and what's not. What he's seeing, what's not. They they make a a clear point to show us that there's been a break for him in ability to focus and process and rationalize. Because why else would a man who's so on top of it, so on top of everything, is so paranoid, controlling of his and not trusting of anyone, all of a sudden switch like that? Is because he's incapacitated by injury by trauma response and by yeah. opioid cloud. And it's all making sense. It's all Santa connected, Santa baby. And like a non-suspicious person is not going to go, you know, they're going to answer the, ask the question, why am I alive? Uh-huh. Because mm-hmm. he knows as the person that would go in there, the people who were not on an agenda would have killed everyone indiscriminately and just all this stuff too immediately. like immediately absolutely like there was yeah. like there's never in that setting there was no reason for him to live ever mm-hmm. why would they let an agent that they know was an agent survive exactly that's I, that that's no yeah. matter what they were up to no matter what they were doing they're not gonna let him live that's outrageous and like the fact that vesper isn't a trained spy she's literally like an exalted accountant and she's able to like pull all these fast ones on him during that period of time also makes no sense yeah, based on that's his skill true. set. Like that she's getting one over on him all the time. I, it makes sense to me. Because Beautiful woman can trick a man because men are stupid. <sighs> men are stupid. Men but are he should stupid. Be, I guess I'm just assuming he should be better than that because of his fucking job to be better than that. I mean, No doubt. He, I, he I mean, he's like, he already figured out that she is like a boyfriend with that Algerian not shit. Like, he knows that like, I feel like but that's his jam yeah I guess I mean remember yeah. he, that's his jam so that makes her more attractive to him not less uh, yeah because he does say she's not my type single and I'm like oh buddy well I mean he's he's honest about it but I mean he does he it doesn't it like make a it joke, better but he doesn't like a joke but that's the kind of joke that your client would tell you in a therapy session and then try to just keep moving like a joke. And like, boop, 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 boop. Um, what? I flagged that. Right, I'm, either yeah. gonna, I'm either gonna make you deal with that now, or I'm really gonna catalog it for later. I really love that you both made the same noise <laughs> yeah. at the same time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that no, I would have the same reaction. That'd be one of the ones where like my clients would like look at me and see the look on my face and be like, "We're gonna have to talk about that, aren't we?" I'm like, "Mm-hmm." mm-hmm. 
and that look of like I don't like you. I have one client in particular who will tell me like when she catches me doing that, like I, you know, I hate you, right? I'm like I, I know, but you're still here, so you said it first, bro. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, but like, like, <sighs> like I'm not going to get away with that one, am I? Like, mm-hmm. no, you're not. <laughs> no, but mm-hmm. yeah, that looking at that like. It's believable to me because men do stupid things. And also I wonder too, like, and this is how little we know about James Bond's background. I know almost nothing, so feel free to correct me, everybody. But, like, if he has the military background, I'm assuming he has. I wonder. He's he's a commander. He's he's an officer. So the point I'm making is, like, I wonder how much socializing he's been able to do up to this point and if he's a little bit arrested development in terms of his romantic endeavors. And so Vester might be the first time that he's, like, really allowed himself the space to be romantically involved with somebody like truly. And so that also might give a be added component to like the high school energy that he brings to this sure. situation as well. Yeah. Like falling hard and fast so quickly. Yeah. In order to, so I, I know that you guys have worked with people who have been working on doctorates and had some clients who were becoming medical doctors. Mm hmm. That level of obsessive competitiveness mm-hmm. is the same, if not greater, yeah. to go to an elite college and then become a military officer mm-hmm. and then move mm-hmm. through selection to special forces. It's that times not only your psychological aptitude, but also your physical aptitude and that isolation of self and competitive nature and like keeping yourself singly focused. So yeah, he probably is arrested development trapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So part of me was, I think I wrote like, is he emotionally underdeveloped? And what I really meant when I wrote that note was like, is this like the, is this like the factor of his life in which he's actually like way, like a bit more young or Mm -hmm. immature. And like, this might be him finally growing in that part of his life, but he's going to seem younger in presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And he is. So the question I have for you guys, Mm -hmm. why does Vesper kill herself? Um, this is why. And I wrote this out of my notes because she's being fridged. Do you know what I'm talking about? By him? He's being fringed, fridged by the writers of James Bond. The term fridge, you know what I'm talking Explain. about? Explain. The term fridge is a term quoted, I can't remember exactly the source material, but basically it is a trope in which a woman is killed, a female presenting person or a woman is killed to move forward the development narrative of the man. So I think the way that it originally came about was that a, a much beloved character was literally killed by being stuck in a refrigerator. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it's called being fridged. But basically, anytime you watch a movie, and this happens a lot, movies, TV shows and stuff, where a well-developed or at least like somewhat developed female character gets killed for no other reason than to push forward the narrative of the man. So it just sent, so it basically is a way that female characters are disposed of at the expense of like the male character. So I wrote Vesper right now is being fridged. Mm -hmm. She's being, she's being killed because it's going to move forward the narrative of James Bond. Cause I do know in the next movies, he, she's like a touchstone. He keeps coming back to mentally and emotionally. She is the driving narrative of the entire series. Exactly. All the way through No Time to Die. So the reason why she kills herself is because it's a narrative device. She's being fridged, in my opinion. Because no, no, no. either that or it's like, I mean, I guess if I'm going to look at it past that. Yes, you have to look at it past Ugh. that on the psychology show. I don't, think we, I don't show. think we do. Well, I yes, think, we do. Well, I think it's, it's bullshit as a narrative point, And that's why I'm like, don't want to look into it I personally. Don't. But I think... If we're going to, I'm sure this is what the screenwriters are telling themselves, is that she feels so much deep shame for double crossing James that she's like, I deserve to die. I don't think that's it either. Well, I don't know what to tell you then. I think that that is what a lot of people think, but Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, fridged, yes, I won't contend that. I will challenge the notion that that's always women because it's literally also every Disney movie killing the parents. Well, and also, I mean, but like, like every time frozen, yeah. do you want to build a snowman? Parents dead. But I think the point what is the that fuck? 
It's at the expense of more well-developed female characters. Also, like, queer characters get killed a lot uh, yeah. in a very similar way, which is a whole different thing. But anyway. They do, but also, seriously, every Disney character kills yeah. every but that's parent. A different, but that's different. That's a different it's, conversation. Well, it's the same. It drive, they, they have to kill the parent in order it's to not drive the, the It's thing. not the same. It's still the same. But no, it's like this, the, dif- the difference is misogyny. But Well, yes. sure. I, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not defending the misogyny. That's, yeah. that's, that's true. Just the mm-hmm. same narrative device exists in Mm -hmm. literally every Disney movie where they kill the parents for Mm -hmm. the same reason because without the parents then the adventure can begin because the parents remove the safety Mm-hmm. But anyway. and it also, but it also isn't destroying a character that's already been well developed in some way or another. Well, sometimes it is. The parents usually we don't know dick about most of the time. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to argue with you about this anymore. Just say whatever you're going to say. <laughs> I'm going to. But with with Vesper, remember, it's not about her betrayal of James. It's about that probably none of her love for him or any of that was ever real, and that it's about her betrayal of whoever Herself. gave her that. Herself, her boyfriend, her the lover, her herself. She, she had to sacrifice all of her morals. She sacrificed queen, country, every ounce of respect put into her, her financial responsibilities to get hoodwinked by these by quantum, basically, which we find out later. But to save the boyfriend that gave her that love knot. Mm-hmm. And which we don't being, know. We don't even see, which I think is wild. We don't. We don't even see him at some point. But she doesn't want to be safe for the deep shame. But it's not the deep shame that she can't give to James. It's the deep shame that she was never his. Yeah. None of that was real. It looked real, but it, none of it was ever real. It was all a game because James tells her when she's asking about the tell. Mm-hmm. He's like, does everybody have a tell? Yes. Everybody Except you. Because he can't figure it out. Because she's playing a game the whole time. Mm-hmm. So d- And she I bet she she stops wearing the knot because she can't bear to have it on anymore. She's probably more like all tells and he like because yeah. she's not acting as herself. Yeah. And but so like there's no discerning tell. That was the tell. The knot? That she took it off. That she uh-huh. took it off. That's the tell. Her behavior doesn't change until she takes it off. She doesn't allow herself to have sex with James until she takes that off. Mm. And she says it was time. That's the whole message of it. That was the tell. And James mm. missed it. Okay. Because he, was getting, he just wanted to be in love with her. Well, right. Well, and, I mean, he's. we talked about what's going on with him. <laughs> Right. A lot. A lot. A lot. He was he was mess, messy. Yeah. I mean messy. I think the shame of that is then that narrative of like she was the victim. She's a hugely a victim in this story. Like she was being terrorized and put in an impossible position where she had to compromise her morals to save for a higher good, very similar to James. Mm-hmm. Very similar to James. Exactly. And so I wish she would have lived to see another day and to work through that. She deserved to. But that's why she doesn't let she locks herself in that and just decides yeah. to end her life because she now feels so much shame that she betrayed everything she ever swore any allegiance to and james is in love with her but what she has given james was never real yeah it, even if some part of it was real what james latched on to what bond wanted from her what real james wanted from her was never what she was giving him it was all an act and like really like talking about it now is where this is all clicking for me and makes me love his movies even more because of you guys haven't seen no time to die yet you need to but looking at how (laughs) all of this drives him Mm -hmm. and the fucked up way he interprets it versus what happened because what the screenwriters show us not the subtext what the screenwriters show us is that like oh she just she couldn't betray james like that and no it has nothing to do with james she can't betray herself and can't bear to live with herself anymore. That this man loves her and is ready to give his entire life and give she up everything. And like she doesn't love him. Yeah, I mean, I'm not arguing with what you're saying. It still feels mildly lazy, story writing wise. Or at least like it's not giving her the same like f- fullness as a character. Like that just make that like, I'm just gonna take myself out of the game. And also, like, she met James, like, a week ago. <laughs> and then heard the story, like, a week, maybe a week and a half. 
Um, Which lends to the argument if it's not real. Yeah. But I just, I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, she's been through a lot. And I'm not going to argue that. I think I just can't get over, like, her dying. <laughs> and then, then how much that bothers me. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. That's more of my final thoughts. Anywho, any more we want to say about attachment? And I know we kind of touched upon his relationship with M sort of earlier in the episode. Um, so if we want to slide into treatment after this break. Treatment. We can, uh, I'm going to pick on you, Ben, and throw it to you first because I haven't thought of anything yet. <laughs> so treatment. We want to throw it to me first. I, I mean, I'm going to keep it short and being mindful that we've already talked a lot about a lot of this. And in the the tone of this movie and the entire series we see with Daniel Craig, this movie springboards directly into Quantum of Solace, which is among my least favorite bonds uh, because of what happens, the narrative choices that they make. They try to make a bad Bourne movie out of a Bond movie in Quantum of Solace. But where we see Bond right now, what happens is Bond goes immediately after Mr. White and takes no time to process, even while he's coming out of his painkiller fog, Vesper tells him, you're freezing me out again. You're shutting me out. I see it. She calls him on switching back into like, his secret agent self as opposed to being James and showing his vulnerable self. Mm-hmm. He does that times a million when he calls M and says, nope, back to duty, the bitch is dead. Ugh, when he said the bitch is dead, like a shiver ran through me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In reality, seeing as that this is my profession, dealing with people who have been through things exactly like this. This is, you know, this has been my profession for at least three years now that... Mm-hmm. What needed to happen is that he needed to be recalled, given time off and debriefings. Absolutely. (coughs) Where he was given time and space and forced to get out of the mask and into himself to be able to get out of right brain processing where your reactionary side lives and into integrating the logical side. Because what happens to people when they go through times like this is people enter what's called split brain processing. Your left side where your logic and ability to rationally live through things stays on, but its main function at that time is ceding control to your right brain where your reactionary side and emergency response system lives and validating the need for that to take over and all the parts of you that live there. But the left side is still recording everything that you do and it expects once the danger is over and your body relaxes that it will be able to extract digest and synthesize the information it was not privy to while the right side was on and that Mm -hmm. is the purpose of a debriefing is that you help people get out of right brain processing where they are still actively trying to survive a threat and the impact of it and get them into left brain processing where they can understand the logical consequences and the impact it has on their core self, not their armored up person in role armor of secret agent, police officer, soldier, firefighter, therapist, anything that can handle that shit and the actual vulnerable side of you that knows what all that means and has feelings about it Mm -hmm. has to be dealt with. And he should have been recalled and taken out of service for some time Mm -hmm. for something like this. Six months. I mean, he tried to quit. That alone, like you driven the resignation. Yeah, and like, yeah. I mean, there's you need a to lo- talk about that. I would, I would imagine. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- honestly, that's not abnormal for people to have gone through something like that and want to quit and want to mm-hmm. be like, okay, so we need because their flight part kicks on and says, "Fuck that," mm-hmm. ever again. Mm-hmm. To quote my child, who loves to say, "Ever again." <laughs> but the the reality of that is like people who go through those things. Their flight part kicks on, and that is in their right brain and it is not until you get the left brain on that the part of them goes like I don't want to quit my job this is my life meaning and this is what I want to do turns back on they go okay I'm not in danger I don't need to run from that will I have experiences like this again maybe but this is also the price of doing what I do and they have to reckon with that or decide they can't anymore both happen but Mm -hmm. you can't make that decision in right brain processing you can't like not reasonably and 
bond needed to be recalled, taken out of service and given time space therapy to process through that. And he was not. And that sets up his arc through the next four movies due to the fridging of Vesperland. But Mm -hmm. it is played out throughout his entire story. And it is something he has to reckon with all the way through the end of no time to die. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as treatment at this phase in this is it five movies he did? I think so. This five movie story. Yeah, five movies. At this point, what needed to happen was a recall and a debriefing and then some pretty serious therapy as he was getting through the debriefing process, working on regulating, getting out of reliving the experience and the consequences of it and being able to rationally process it with core self that lives in your left brain. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, I... Mine will be short. Um, I Let's pretend Vesper lives and I see her after this. So I think kind of similar to what you're talking about, Ben, she'd need like, deep, you know, she'd need a lot of down decompression space. But I think once we got through like a, that immediate like grounding part where she needs to just kind of deescalate, um, I think kind of what we had referenced earlier is I think she would be someone who would benefit from some psychoeducation around like being a victim mm-hmm. or like her role in that, like, I think sometimes as therapists, our job is to be sort of on the side of our client, like kind of, um, well, unconditional positive regard is from Rogerian and Carl's Rogers based therapy. And it's this idea that no matter what you hold your client in po- unconditional positive regard. And what that looks like is that, um, we are just, I don't know, kind to them and try to recalibrate what happened to them with more perspective. And so for her, I think a lot of what would be powerful for her is for me as the therapist to identify for her what happened to her and use different terms than maybe what she's using for herself. Like I definitely see her coming into therapy and speaking of herself pretty poorly the way that you were kind of talking about Ben earlier. And my job would be to say, actually like this is what happened to you. And let's, let's try to like reconstitute and reframe some of these things so that she can have more compassion for herself because in order to grow and move forward within therapy, you have to, there has to be some part of you that cares about you enough to think that you deserve to feel better. And so that would be me trying to access that for her. It's not very dissimilar when I work with more often than not like adult clients who had childhood trauma. And so, and they'll come in and they'll be like, yeah, but like I did this and I didn't do that. And like really blaming themselves for a lot of things. And, and my job can sometimes be to like tell them, you know, no, like you were a child or no, you were put in a victim position. Like that was abuse. Like, and so my job sometimes is to help bring some terms, identify things, do some, like I said, psychoeducation around that dynamic. And so I think she would really benefit from that. And I think just kind of processing that with her was where I would want to start with her once she's kind of, like I said, gotten to a calmer place, like de-escalated place. But I think that's what I would want to work with her on. So that's kind of my, just my treatment idea is kind of how I would connect to the story. Because honestly, other than what you said, Ben, there isn't really a lot of meat, I guess, as like for me. Is there anything you want to add, Hannah? Yeah, no, I feel the same way. I feel like there isn't really a lot more that I would say, or even like would be appropriate at this stage, like in general. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, so I don't think I have anything to add at all. Because I'll tell you this, you know who's not going to therapy? (laughs) James James Bond. Bond. (laughs) Oh no, not this version of him. This version's on a mission. He is in full destroy mode. This is also very like um, therapy is for pussies energy this kind of person like the kind of person he is like mental health mental health um all right so final thoughts i can start um i really like this movie when it first came out i think because i really like the born movies and i like that kind of style mm-hmm. where it's a lot more like grounded and seems like more like realistic and and i thought the parkour scene was hot in the beginning i thought that was really cool parkour was really popping off at that time and and i i mean i really like daniel craig as bond and that he has a whole different energy to it and so and like stylistically i like the bond movies i like the songs that come with them and the opening credits i think it's all very cool and interesting but i would say like watching as a therapist made me like this movie a lot less which i know sometimes happens on this show like they fall victim to therapizing them and so 
I think, and maybe because I'm a little bit older, like I said in the, in the big, like earlier in this episode, like I'm older than the first time I watched it. I've also become more feminine, like I'm more of a feminist since I watched this the first time. And so I think it was also just hard to watch how he treated women, even though I know that's part of the Bond persona. Yeah. He's, and maybe because this movie is more grounded in reality, it just seemed way crueler the way he was treating women in this movie, including Vesper and... And even the woman in the beginning, whose name I can't even recall, even if if she even had one, um, it just seems more like ruthless and callous and just it put me off in such a way that he can't really make up for it with his like charm and like in his fighting and his like hot bod. Like I was like, ugh, like so. And then like I just thought like the whole end part, which we've talked about now, which I think maybe makes me more understanding. But I was just like, this seems so hyperbolic and like dramatic and silly and stuff but i don't know will i ever watch it again it's two and a half hours long so no <laughs> probably not maybe it was on tv depending on the part that it was on i'd be like okay i'll watch like the parkour scene i always want to watch i really like that opening sequence like i really like it um just action wise and choreography wise it's really cool but other than that i'm gonna take a i'm gonna say no hannah <laughs> um, I feel like so this is the first time I've ever seen this movie um, I don't remember ever seeing it before um, yeah I was just trying to think like have I, I no I really hadn't seen this movie before okay um, so it's fine um, <laughs> uh, I think I like it a little better after talking about it with Ben and Brittany um, which sometimes does happen. Um, but am I going to watch it again? No. Hell no. I'm, I'm definitely not going to watch this movie again. It's too long. And and uh, just no thank you. I like the... I did, I did watch Skyfall and I think another one. And I, I remember enjoying those films. But this one is no thanks. All right. Ben, take us home. I, I will. And I'm going to remind you to as I often do that you guys are both wrong <laughs> this movie is awesome the, yeah whatever this, uh, it's, how it, unlike us this had white male to tell us <laughs> that we're wrong <laughs> about a but film but I mean I think this is very much like not <laughs> no I'm just fucking I, with you guys which I think we do talk about like this is not maybe for us maybe See, it's more for you I can accept that <laughs> That's fair because, you know, like things like there are several movies that I've had, you know, with with openness, like this is a great film. It was not for me and that's okay. But the this is a this is a fantastic introduction to a new era of Bond. They Mm -hmm. really inverted a lot of the sexy, smarmy, like slimy kind of. (laughs) <laughs> like glorified yeah. chauvinistic behavior of Sean Connery and Roger Moore in particular and took a dark realistic turn which is always going to be something that I'm going to lean into and like more is show me the real side of it show me the consequences show me a conflicted character show me something that's interesting I don't like the 80s hero movies were like, they never reload their guns, they never run out of ammo, they just walk around blasting things and occasionally get a scratch. You know, I, I don't like that. There's no consequences for their behaviors. That's not my jam. I like movies like this where there's an air of realism to it. They tie into the consequences of the characters' behaviors and everything is layered and complex to the point that there are some parts of this movie that I didn't even really process until we started talking about it and I've watched it so many times. <laughs> it, it, you know, I loved this movie when it came out. The That opening sequence is just one of the best tone setters I've ever seen of like, this is not a, the same, and mm-hmm. I, I don't mean yeah. like that. Like the the parkour scene and all that was awesome, but I mean the way that they incorporated such Britishness into his conversation with the man that he was about to kill, where they're both like knowing that they're both about to try to kill each other, and they're maintaining their decorum and their rules and their manners with each other, and having that like we see what bond just went through with drowning that dude brutally in black and white they deconstructed everything that he was all the slick kills all the clever shit none of that he is fighting a man to the death with his bare hands and drowning him in a sink yeah that is a complete inversion of how other bond movies started like with 
Pierce Brosnan dropping down through a bathroom hole and like making some smart ass comment while a Russian is reading the newspaper. And it, th- this movie set a tone immediately that we're doing things different. This bond is different. Welcome to the 2000s bonds yeah. now. And I really liked this movie. I still like it. I do not like Quantum of Solace. I liked all of the other ones. The way that this movie painted the picture of a new era of Bond and took it into a less ridiculous, less despicable, but more consequential and accurate depiction of what someone who is living this life might be like without Mm -hmm. the glorification of like, look, this dude's just out there like just slaying it. Yeah. Like he's getting anything he wants. He's got the cool cars. He doesn't he's even got... lose the lose the pleatness pants. Nope. <laughs> he's got the dope suit. He's got the dope car. He's just out there like just mm-hmm. like beautiful women are just throwing themselves at him and he's just like Barf. like I am going to have my way with you and uh deuces mm-hmm. and then I might rescue you from the bad guys so that we can like get it on and I can make a ridiculous comment like I thought Christmas only came once a year Ugh. again, which is just so bad. Mm-hmm. But this inverted all of that. Mm-hmm. and tried to like like I think the last De- Jedi tried to pull from kind of what this did with the tone setting of like let's invert things and let's make it all more realistic and mm-hmm. this that makes sense this did it a lot better than that did although there were parts of that that I love regardless of what some of our reviewers say who criticize us for liking last Jedi they can it's cram the it. best Star Wars movie so that is inaccurate <laughs> it is it is not <laughs> that will always be favorite. true it is, is <laughs> remains ESB <laughs> Remains ESP. But the reality of just like what world is said, like Daniel Craig played Bond longer than anybody else. Mm hmm. Yeah, I like was surprised because I was like looking up the ages like I like to do. And I was like, wow, he's 38. Like, I don't think I realized how young he started playing Bond. I think in my brain, he's always like mid 40s. And so, yeah. Yeah, he, he started playing Bond and he played him through the different age points. And this started that tone. And they stuck with the same story this is the first time they've done that with a bond usually it's just like sitcom 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 like standalone movies pretty much standalone like the consequences of one movie don't necessarily work into the next and this Mm -hmm. set up a whole arc that they ended beautifully with no time to die i know some people disagreed with what happened in that movie they're also incorrect that movie was excellent Mm -hmm. and (laughs) i loved the way that this painted a picture and started it all, except for Quantum of Solace, that is trash. <laughs> <laughs> so you will watch again? I will absolutely watch this again. Okay. Well, on that note, um, you can find us at Instagram and uh, Facebook at Popcorn Psychology, Twitter at Popcorn under- underscore Psych. You can email us at popcornpsychology at gmail.com. We're also on TikTok at Popcorn Psychology. Um, we have a Patreon if you would like to support us. Um, as we are DIYing this. And so we always uh, appreciate um, our patrons and there's some cool um, benefits to that too. If you are a patron for $50, you can even pick an episode, like a movie that we talk about on an episode. Um, we Which also we had someone do. And yeah. because of that, this season, we will be doing something that several people have asked us for, but now someone selected yeah. that perk and are going to get it. We are going to do Gone Girl. Yeah, because guess what, people? We have a price, and it's $50. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. And then um, also, if you want to get merch, Tee Public, um, you can find us at Tee Public at Popcorn Psychology. Um, we have, like, mugs and T-shirts and all this kind of stuff. Phone covers, pillowcases, it, literally anything you want with our logo on it, you can yeah. get made there. Yeah, so, and if you would like to leave us a review, we always appreciate that at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We read them all. We look at them all. So when you do, if you do leave one for us, we do always you know, notice that and appreciate it. And you can always reach us at popcornpsychology at gmail.com if you have any questions, requests, anything like that. Um, and we will see you all later.